Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Good to be back at FaithBridge. Thanks so much for letting me come back be here. Uh, 75 years ago this year, there was a, a radio broadcast by CBS Radio when all over the country, Orson Welles uh, was sort of the leading person in this radio drama. It's called War of the Worlds. And uh, some of you no doubt remember this. Uh, maybe you heard about it, but uh, it was broadcast. And, uh, and, and, and the story goes that uh, when it was actually initially broadcast, October 30th, 1938, uh, it, it, it announced um, as a part of a radio drama that there had been a, a Martian landing. Um, and uh, and, and the, the Martians uh, had invaded uh, our planet all over the world, and, and things were not going well for our side, and, uh, and, uh, and that it looked really bleak, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the story goes that it, it touched off, ignited a panic. Uh, because people either tuned in late or just, you know, whatever, they, they thought it was really real. And, and, uh, and uh, it, it's like the guy, the first time he heard the song, there's a bomb in Gilead. Go, oh, my gosh, they're bombing Gilead. But, uh, but it was like, he, he, they, they, it was just a huge panic. And, uh, and now it turns out that uh, they've gone back and they actually looked at some of the uh, listener surveys at the time, and, and, and probably the idea of some sort of nationwide panic is way, way overblown. But, but clearly, uh, there are a lot of people who, who, who discovered, uh, much to their relief, that all the world, the world, just, just a big hoax. Last week, we, we began a series uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, where the Apostle Paul warns us about a war of the worlds. That is anything but a hoax. It's not a play fight. It's not pretend. It's a, it's a real battle. And, and our opponent in this battle is a, a being who is named uh, by various names in Scripture, either opponent or scandal or adversary. Uh, we're, 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 we're told that uh, not so much about his power, but in Ephesians chapter 6, we're warned gravely about his strategies his schemes, his wiles, and that, uh, that we need to be cautious about this. We need to take seriously the battle in which we're engaged. If you remember last week when we sort of began this discussion, um, we talked about the fact that the Apostle Paul, as he wrote these words in Ephesians chapter 6, writing to the church at Ephesus, he was actually uh, under guard by a Roman soldier. And so as he sat there, either chained to a Roman guard or in front of a Roman guard, he began to sort of look at their armor and, and, and realize that in many, many ways, we as believers are also armed and equipped for the battle to which we are called, the battle in which we're engaged, this war of the worlds. And uh, last week, we began to look at the first two pieces of armor that the Apostle Paul identified. We talked about the under armor. We talked about the girdle, the belt of truth. And then we talked about the breastplate of righteousness, the belt, because everything else is buckled to it. That's the very first piece of armor that a Roman legionnaire would put on. Everything else is connected that it all starts with the belt of truth. But then the breastplate of righteousness, which protects our heart. We said this week we want to finish out our discussion by looking at four pieces of outer armor, the last four pieces that Paul identifies in Ephesians chapter 6. So uh, if you have a Bible, um, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. If you don't have a Bible, uh, if you just put your hand up, we will make sure the ushers would love to give you one to read and to follow along. So just put your hand up in the air. We'll make sure that you get one. Meanwhile, I'm going to ask uh, if we could put this up on the screen Let's read through this passage together. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10. Paul warns us gravely about this, this war of the world, this, this cosmic struggle in which we're engaged. Five times he uses the word against, 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 and yet he says to us that we have in Christ a victor and a victory. So let's read together verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6. You can see it on the screen. Let's read it out loud. Let's read. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world 
and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Last week, we sort of learned a little, um, a little way of trying to remember the different pieces of armor. Does anybody remember what those uh, pieces of armor that we talked about last week? Okay, yeah, not one person. Uh, no, no, you're, you're, you're laughing, but it, it does kind of make me want to reconsider God's call on my life. But, uh, but no, um, let, let's just try to rehearse it one more time. It starts out with the belt, the breastplate, the boot, the bonnet, the sword, the shield. You already won it. Now, if you weren't here last week, uh, the bonnet, that, that's uh, a little bit of a liberty there. It's actually the helmet, but helmet doesn't begin with B. So we have the belt, the breastplate, the boot, the bonnet, the sword, the shield, and then an affirmation, a proclamation that, hey, in Christ we have victory. Paul opens this book, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, by saying that in Christ we have a power that's above all earthly powers, above all powers, that his name is above every name. So we already have a victory that's won in Christ. The question is, are we willing to share? Are we willing to partake? Are we willing to let Christ stand before us as our victor? So we have the belt, the breastplate, the boot, the bonnet, the sword, the shield. We've already won it. What we want to do this morning is look at these remaining four pieces of armor that are given to us as a part of our equipment in Christ. The first of those is the boot. The boot. Uh, Paul talks about the belt, the breastplate, the boot, having put on your feet the equipment of the gospel of peace. The Roman soldier, uh, they were known for their ability to make long marches. Uh, Roman legions were large, but they could move remarkably fast. To do this, they had to have a specific type of special footwear. Uh, the footwear had to equip them for both a strong stand in battle you had to be able to get a grip so that you could stand strong. At the same time, you had to have footwear that was light enough that you could walk long distances. And, and so designed for the Roman army was a special kind of footwear called a half boot, a half boot. It was, it was a kind of a boot down to the bottom, strong and sturdy right around the foot. But then it kind of came up around the calf with, uh, with leather that would attach it tightly to the calf so that you were equipped for both the strong stand and a long march. The Apostle Paul says to us that, that we are engaged as well in a faith, a struggle that requires a strong stand and a long march. The Christian life requires us to stand, stand therefore, stand strong. Four times Paul uses the word stand in this short passage we just read. That's important. But it's also important that we understand it's not just standing, it's a long walk. It's a journey that the Christian life is not about a sprint. It's about a marathon. And so we likewise, we need to have a, a faith that equips us for a strong stand and a long march. You know, it's interesting, um, in, in the Civil War, some of you are Civil War buffs, you may remember that, that uh, Stonewall Jackson, uh, one of the reasons Stonewall Jackson was so feared by Union generals is because he had a remarkable knack for being able to move his troops uh, long distances very, very quickly. Literally, uh, it would sometimes appear that he, had just, he would just kind of show up in front of a Union general. That's one of the reasons that, that Lincoln always kept one huge division protecting Washington because he was afraid that, that Jackson was going to show up. They actually called uh, Jackson's division Stonewall Jackson's Foot Cavalry because they, they, were, they were known for this ability to stand strong and walk long. That is the heritage of those of us who are followers of Christ. But how do we do that, Paul says? How, what, what sort of armament do we have on our feet that equips us for the strong stand and the long march? Well, in the scripture, Paul refers to it as the equipment of the gospel of peace. The equipment of the gospel of peace. What, is that, what does that actually mean? Well, at the heart of it is a very, very simple idea. The good news that when we are involved in this long journey, 
when we take a stand for Christ, we recognize that we have a God who goes before us. And we have a God who comes behind us. In fact, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 12 puts it like this. Run the race with perseverance, looking unto Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter. So he's the pioneer. He walks before us. He's the perfecter who comes behind us. In other words, the good news of the gospel, the the, the good news of the gospel that, that gives us peace with God because we have peace of God is, is simply this, that, that, that Jesus is not some commander who sends us into battle and says, go for it. <laughs> you know, make a run for it. See if you can do it. And if you do, you can share in my victory. He goes before us. He's the pioneer. But even better than that, good news, even better than that, is that he also is the one who comes behind us. He's not saying, hey, if you make it, if you really do a good job, uh, then then, uh, if everything's come out okay and you win the victory, then okay, I will claim you as my own. Jesus goes before us. Jesus comes behind us. Jesus is with us. He helps us every single step of the way. He's the pioneer. He's the perfecter. And that is good news that gives us peace in the middle of the battle in this war. I remember uh, when I was in high school, I went to this camp in North Carolina. It was a YMCA camp at Blue Ridge Assembly. And, uh, and it was a fun week. And at the last day, they wanted to uh, take a picture of everybody at the camp. There, there were about 500 high school students at this camp. And so they uh, moved everybody over to Lee Hall, this kind of grand uh, antebellum looking structure with a massive uh, stair, you know, stairway out front and, and uh, big, huge columns. And they, they got everybody lined up on the, on the porch, uh, down the steps and then up at the very top row on the porch. Back then, some of you remember this, when, when uh, you wanted to take a picture that large, you, you, you really didn't have too many options. If you went back far enough to get everybody in one shot, you, you wouldn't see anybody's faces. And you didn't have the option of, of doing the kind of, you know, zoom or, or, you know, pan that you can do nowadays with digital equipment. So what they would do, so we recall this, is they'd actually set up the camera twice. You, you, you know, you get one picture like this, and then you go down and reset the camera and get one picture like this. And then somebody in a dark room, a lab, would actually kind of combine them together, fuse them together. So you got everybody in one, in one shot. Well, I don't know what, what uh, I was thinking, but, but I thought, oh, this would be kind of fun. And so what I did was when they started to shoot this side of the group, I went in the very back row up in the right-hand corner. And just before they snapped the picture, I went like this. Then, when they reset the camera for the other side, I ran behind the group down the front porch and got to the other left-hand corner, and just before they snapped the picture, I went like this. (laughs) When the picture finally got developed, I was waving at myself from both ends of the picture. I showed my mom. I said, Mom, look at this. I'm in both places. Well, you know, I said, I have superpowers of which you're not aware. But, but, but this is basically what, what we are being told about God is that his son Jesus is not just at the end saying, if you can make it, I'm for you. He's not at the beginning saying, good luck. God be with you. He's at both ends of the picture. That is good news. That is a gospel that gives us peace, that, that it gives us peace so that we can take a strong stand and, and a long march. Because there are those times, aren't there, when we wonder, can I really, can I really pull this off? Can I really, can I really do it? And, and, and sometimes we get discouraged because we go, I, I want to be involved in the, in the journey, but I kind of tempted to veer off this way, or maybe you balk, or maybe you slow down. And, 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 and all of a sudden, the enemy uses this kind of strategy of discouragement to say, just give up. You can't. You can't do it. I remember, I remember hearing as a youth pastor about this guy. He had a, he had a kid that got, and went to one of his retreats, and he came back from the retreat. And, and uh, this guy was a junior in high school, and he, he, he made a commitment to Jesus, and he wants to really live out his faith. But doggone it, he's, it's just hard because he's, he's, he's struggling with lust. And he doesn't want to, he knows he shouldn't have these thoughts, but he walks down the hallway of the high school. And you wouldn't believe what goes through his mind. And, and he finally goes to his youth pastor and said, I'm sorry, every time I try not to think of this stuff, 
I'm thinking of the stuff I'm not supposed to think about. And that just, and he says, he gets more and more discouraged. Pretty sure God's given up on him and just fed up with the whole thing. And I don't blame God for getting ticked off. I'm ticked off of me. And who was I to think I could ever be a Christian? And, and finally just gets discouraged. He starts pounding on the youth pastor's desk. He said, I'm just going to pray right now. God, just take away my sexual desire. And the youth pastor went, wait a minute. <laughs> he said, let me leave the room in case he misses. But, but I, I think what happens <laughs> is that there are probably some of us here today. There are probably some of us right in this room this morning. That's where you are. It, it, it impedes your march. It makes it hard for you to take a stand because you're pretty doggone sure God has given up on you. No, no. This is a Jesus who goes before you. It's a Jesus who comes behind you. It's a Jesus who's with you every step of the march. That's the good news of peace that equips our feet. Strong stand, long march. Paul talks about a second piece of equipment, and that's the helmet. The helmet of salvation. The belt, the breastplate, the boot, the bonnet. The helmet of salvation. I don't think you'd have to be any kind of military genius to recognize the importance. If you are engaged in battle, you need to have something to protect your head. Uh, if there are two vital organs <clears throat> that must be protected at all costs, the first is the heart, the breastplate. The second is the head, the brain. That, that's the, that's the, the center of all commands. That's where it all starts. And so you had to have something to protect your head. Um, I, I remember as a, a, when I was a little boy, I played Pop Warner football and uh, kind of like Pee Wee football. And I, I probably started like in about fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade into about eighth grade, ninth grade. And um, and back then, I wasn't the big strapping dude you see today. Back then, it's not funny. And, uh, and, and, and I remember that uh, my position on the team was I actually played fullback. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with football, uh, fullback is a guy that, that runs the ball. Uh, I played second string fullback, which meant my role primarily on the team was to, was to run the ball during practice. Uh, and, and, and I did this because this gave our defensive teams, our first string defense, an opportunity to, to tackle us. And it would bolster their confidence. And, uh, and, 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 and they, could, uh, they could just practice uh, inflicting injury uh, because we were expendable. And, uh, and so I, I remember, in a way, uh, wanting very badly to you know, be able to carry the ball. I wanted to do that. But on the other hand, I didn't really want to carry the ball because people would aim for you with their bodies. And, and anyway, I remember one day we were at practice and uh, first string defense is out there, second string offense, and, uh, and the quarterback called to play 32 on two, which means the number three player, that's me, the fullback, goes to the number two hole, which is just to the right of the center, on the count of two. So it's going to be hot one, hot two. And sure enough, we're in our position. And as soon as I get down in my stance and I hear the quarterback begin to make the count, I look up and directly in front of me on the defensive side of the football is this big, huge guy, the biggest guy on our team, linebacker, a guy by the name of Alan Guggenheim. And, 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 and Alan, I mean, even, even the name Guggenheim just fit. Like, like if his name had been like, you know, Prince, it wouldn't have worked. But, but, uh, but I mean, his name was like Alan Guggenheim. And he's just snarling and just looking at me, you know, just uh, like a raw meat with a dog. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and I remember the quarterback, you know, called my, you know, hut one, hut two, sticks the ball right there in my gut. And I run as hard as I can. And I'm doing okay for the first step. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, then we got to uh, we got to the line. I just run into a brick wall. Uh, and, and, uh, and next thing I knew, my world just began to spin like this. Alan grabs my head and just starts just kind of, you know, just wrenching me around. I would have happily just sat down. But no, no, he had to make this difficult for one of us. And, and, and so he flipped me around. And I finally, when he threw me to the ground, I literally like rolled over several times. And when I come to, when I finally open my eyes, there's just a little tunnel of vision. Everything's black except this one little tunnel. Well, somebody ran over and turned my helmet around. But I, I, just, you know, I, was, I was actually looking through the earpiece. But I, I remember thinking, man, uh, I am glad I had that helmet. Can you, I'm trying to imagine my senior picture with my nose somewhere over here. You know, and, and, uh, and, and this, is, this is what Paul is saying is that your head is critical. 
to protect your head, we have in Christ a particular piece of headgear. It's called the helmet. He describes it in this passage as the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Now, what does he mean by that? Because that's one of those kind of religious, the helmet of salvation. You know, what, the, what he means is, in this case, happens to be very clear. Because in a parallel passage in 1 Thessalonians, we're able to see Paul in a parallel way walk through the armor of God in a second letter, a separate letter, this time the church at Thessalonica. And in that particular letter, he refers to the helmet of hope or the hope of of salvation, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. So in other words, when Paul talks about the helmet of salvation, he's talking about a hope that we have in Christ. What is that hope? It is that Christ is at work in us. It is that salvation is not just something that happened. It's not something just happened once where you kind of look back and, you know, 30 years ago I was sanctified and justified and petrified. It, it, it's, a, it's an onward motion that God is saving us, that he's making us into his likeness. He's forming us into the likeness of Christ. In fact, this is exactly the kind of language Paul uses. In Colossians 1, he says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Is that those times when Satan tries to play tricks with your head, when you, when you start to be assailed by those, those kind of doubts that, that, that God's giving up on me. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm not the husband I want to be. I'm not the dad I want to be. I, I, I wish I could be more faithful. They don't share my faith enough with my friends at school. God's probably mad. Is, is that recognize, here's the hope, is that God is at work in you. And that work is not yet complete. That he's forming us into the likeness of his son. We've been predestined to be conformed to the image of God's son, Romans 6. But it's an ongoing work. It's an ongoing work. And when you start to kind of hear those questions and those doubts, and when Satan tries to kind of fool you with these strategies of discouragement, buckle tightly that helmet of salvation, that helmet of hope that speaks to the enemy's lies with defiance. It says, no, Christ is at work in me. It's the hope of salvation. So we have the belt, the breastplate, the boot, the helmet, the bonnet. The next piece of armor that Paul talks about is the shield, the shield of faith with which we quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. I remember the first time I preached in this passage, I was reading from the RSV and I was a little bit nervous. It was one of my very first sermons. And, uh, and, and in the RSV, the passage is translated, with which you quench the fiery darts of the evil one. And, uh, and, and uh, that's great. The problem was uh, when I said fiery darts, I, I reversed those two first letters. And uh, yeah, you're laughing, but I mean, people started thumbing through their Bibles, you know. <laughs> Some people are going, oh my gosh, chemical warfare. But, but, but basically, what, what Paul's talking about here is, is actually one of the familiar tactics that was used in combat, in warfare at the time. Uh, pretty much one of the most uh, feared strategies of combat in those days was when you were engaged in warfare, your, one of your best strategies for being able to assault the enemy without being in hand-to-hand -hand combat was by using arrows. But they used a particular kind of arrow. They would take the arrow and they would dip it in tar uh, and, and, or creosote, and then they would light that on fire. Just stick it in a fire, light that, and shoot that arrow at the enemy, this flaming arrow. It's kind of a universal symbol of unfriendliness. And, and basically, uh, you, you can imagine this would be a very, very effective and lethal means of combat. Well, so what the Roman army did was they had to form some way to defend themselves against these flaming arrows. And so what they did was they began to equip every single Roman legionnaire with a large shield. The shield was primarily wooden, but it had this added feature. It was wooden coated with leather. It had a little bit of a leather uh, sort of a cover on the outside. And then right before they went in the battle, they would soak that shield so the leather would get wet. So when the arrows came in, they would go right through the leather. They would go right into the shield but the leather, the moist leather, would quench the fiery darts, quench the flaming arrows. In, in fact, uh, historians, Roman historians will tell you that, that a legion that stayed behind their shield, 
uh, was very, very effective and almost impassable in combat because what they would do is the guys in the front of the assault, they would just stand down behind their shields and then the next row guys would actually hold the shields up like this. So it was almost an impenetrable front line. After the first arrows had come through, then they could raise their shields for attack. But primarily their best defense was to stand behind that shield. Paul says for you and for me, that we have a very, very effective weapon of defense if we will cling to it, and that is the shield of faith. The shield of faith. That that means that, that when you and I are assailed by the enemy's questions or doubts or temptations, those times when, when maybe you, 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 you get bad news or you've been praying for something and God seems not to hear your prayer. Or you've, you've asked, Lord, I need to find work. I need to find a job or I need to find a better job or help me to interact better with my employer. This guy's driving me crazy or just help me, Lord. At school, I, I, I'm getting bullied. And, 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 bad. and what happens is you start to get these flaming darts from the evil one. And, and, and there's no easy answer to it. There's no quick defeat. All you can do, Paul says, sometimes the most effective strategy is to cling to that shield of faith, hunker down. In fact, it's interesting, you know, these, these shields were not movable. They were, they were about four feet tall. They were very, very heavy. They were not designed for a lot of forward motion. They were designed to stand. It's interesting, in this particular passage of scripture, four times we're told to stand. Stand, therefore, withstand, stand. Having done all, stand. Because really the posture of faith, the posture of faith is not always having the right answer. It's not saying I understand everything is going on. I don't know how this battle is going to turn out right now. I know how the war is going to end and I cling to faith in my victor. And I know there's some of us here this morning. You are being assailed by flaming arrows of the evil one in different ways, different parts of your life. I'm not going to stand up here and make some promise I can't keep. I'm not going to say it's all going to work great. It is a battle. But here's what we must do in those times. Above all else, cling to that shield of faith. Cling to the shield. Stand strong. Because here's one thing we do know. There is nothing, there is no armor to protect our backside. You read through Ephesians 6, there's nothing to protect your rear. Once you start to run, once you start to surrender, the battle is lost. Cling to that shield of faith. And I know there are some of you this morning, courageously, that's the battle you're fighting. Cling to that shield. The shield of faith can quench those flaming arrows of the evil one. The belt, the breastplate, the boot, the helmet, the shield. <clears throat> the last piece of armor that Paul points us to is the sword of of the spirit, the sword of the spirit, which in this case, Paul tells us quite literally is the word of God, the word of God. The Roman soldier had one piece of offensive weaponry. Like if you're a Roman soldier, you don't go into battle uh, planning to hit somebody with your shoe. You know, you, you, you don't say, hey, let's hit him with our, you know, breastplate. You, you, and you sure as heck aren't going to rip off your girdle. So, so, so what do you do if you're in combat? You have one piece of offensive weaponry. It's your sword. It's your sword. And Paul says, you and I have as a piece of offensive weaponry, what he refers to is the sword of the spirit. What does he mean by this? Well, he's very explicit. That means the words of God, the words of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Now, now what that means is that you and I, in the face of this assault by one who Jesus described as the father of lies, in the, in the face of this assault from one who Paul describes as not so much powerful, but a schemer, a, a, a slanderer, we have one piece of offense with reference to which to fight back, and that is the sword of the Spirit. Jesus said, my word is truth. What better weaponry to equip us for the fight when we're going into battle against one whose main strategy is deceit than to hold tight to the word of the Lord, which is truth. Now, here's the problem. Frankly, most of us, most of us in the church, in this church, in most churches, most of us in Christian, we don't have 
much knowledge of the Bible. Because we kind of figure that that's the preacher's job. Their, their job is to kind of study the Bible for the rest of us. And, 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 and so I don't really know, you know much. And, 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 and frankly, some of the surveys, there's been research done. If you ask the average churchgoer, what does it mean to be a Christian? Or, or you know, what is it, how can you explain what it means, what you believe as a believer in Christ? What does that mean? And, and most of us lack the vocabulary. We don't even know. What, what, what we really believe. We don't really know where it is in scripture. Uh, there, there was a study that came out a few years ago by a sociologist named Christian Smith, who is at Notre Dame University. And, uh, and it's called the National Study of Youth and Religion. You can look it up online, nsyr.org. One of the parts of his study that was kind of intriguing was he surveyed um, a huge number, several hundred young people who were engaged in churches. And one of the ways they researched this group was they simply did a word count. So in other words, every time an individual mentioned a certain word, they would just mark it. They would just check it off. And, and then they made a list of all the different kind of terminology that was used by these, by these young people. What was striking was when they asked young people in churches, Christian youth groups, Christian young people, to talk about what it means to believe in God, how seldom any of them ever used any biblical terms. Like, like terms like salvation or sanctification or justification, those two terms, justification and sanctification, were never used once by any of those students. In, in fact, uh, the term grace was only spoken by four people. And in each case, in every one of those cases, they actually used the word grace in reference to the TV show, Will and Grace. Uh, so I guess it also counts as a reference to, to free will. But, but it's, like, it's like they lack the vocabulary. And I, mean, I hate to say it, but I think, frankly, this is pretty much their experience in their homes. You know, most of us really don't know what, why we believe. We don't know much about the scripture. And, 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 and you know, you, you say, well, do you know any of the Bible? And we usually can know maybe a little bit of kind of part of a couple of gospel verses and, and, and maybe a, a phrase from Ben Franklin and, and the chorus of Frozen. You know, and, and, uh, and it's kind of how we, uh, but, and so what happens is we're going to go into combat uh, in cosmic war of the worlds against an enemy whose main strategy is deceit. And here's our sword. It's a little tiny little thing like this. So we go into battle with all the power of a good pocket knife. Got this yesterday at the Admirals Club at Dallas-Fort Worth there. They had a bunch of them laying out for free. I grabbed 100. But uh, <laughs> you're laughing, but I can sell these things. And, uh, and also in hotel rooms, soap, shampoo, that's all free. But anyway, they, uh, that, that, that's, that's our problem. And, 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 and you go, but, but Duffy, I, you know, I, I want to study the Bible, but I kind of read this stuff and I don't know really, I don't know what it means and I'm not sure how to do it. And you kind of start reading at Genesis and by the time you get to Leviticus, you're just like, holy cow. You know, I, I don't think I will get in trouble if I could sacrifice a bird today. And, and, uh, and, and let me give you, a, if, you're, if you're here visiting and this is kind of a new, or maybe you come to Faith Bridge regularly and your Faith Bridge said, I, I guess I don't really I haven't really learned to feed myself. Let me give you a very simple strategy for Bible study. Very simple. It involves three steps. It, it's a simple idea. It begins by when you read a text. And I would say start with a passage. Maybe start with the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, New Testament. Just begin reading chapter one. And simply as you read, maybe read a half a chapter, ask three questions. First of all, what does it say? What does it say? Secondly, what does it mean? What does it mean? And then thirdly, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to me? Uh, it, another way to think about it is observation. What does it say? Interpretation. What does it mean? Application. What does it mean to me? You go, but how do I know if I'm interpreting right? Because people always say there's so many different interpretations. Let me suggest that if, you, if you're kind of new at this, um, but, and, and, and even if you're not new at it, a great resource is to use some of the online commentaries. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the folks back there to put on the screen three of my favorite websites for free online commentary on Scripture. You don't have to pay for any of this stuff. You don't have to have a vast library. You don't need to know Greek and Hebrew. These are right there. You can read through and you can say, okay, what, what do Bible scholars say this particular passage means? So first of all, observation, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? And then application, what does it mean to me? And, and if you can't remember this, all you have to do is just remember the first letters of each of those three words. Observation, interpretation, application, 
O-I-A. What does that spell? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you go, you go, what was that thing Duffy said? Oh, yeah, and you've got it. And, 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 and so it's, it's that simple. Observation, interpretation, application, because this is our sword. You know what's intriguing as you go through these pieces of weaponry? As you go through the armor of God, is that there's no place in the passage where we're actually called to fight. You know why? Because we have a champion. We have a victor. In Christ. In fact, over and over in Scripture, what we're called to do is to stand, to withstand, to stand therefore. Exodus chapter 14, God says to Moses, The Lord will fight for you this day. All you need to do is stand still. Even James, James, who's always commissioning us to action, always calling us to action. James chapter 4, verse 7, he says, Resist the devil. Resist the devil because Jesus is our champion. Jesus is our fighter and Jesus is our victor. It was the summer between my junior and senior year in high school. I was sleeping late one morning in the summer and, um, and I got a phone call. I was waking up by a phone call. The phone was in mom and dad's bedroom. So I ran down the hall, got the phone and there's this very urgent voice on the phone and said, I need to speak with Guy Robbins. I said, my dad, my dad's not here. Uh, well, do well, um, you have your dad's? And I said, well, here's my dad's number. Here's my mom's office number. My brother had left earlier in the morning. And so I give them both phone numbers. And I said, well, what's up? So this is Charlotte Memorial Hospital. This is the emergency room. And son, I need to speak with one of your parents urgently. Your brother's been in an accident on his motorcycle. As soon as I hear this, it sort of begins, my mind kind of defogs, and I realize, that's right, dad's out of town this week. So I said, you're going to have to call my mom. I said, here's her phone number. Call my mom, but do me a favor. Um, please give me about a 10-minute head start because I don't have a car. I'm going to have to hitchhike down to the hospital, and I would like to be there when my mom arrives because she's going to be crying. And, um, and, of course, the guy said, that's out of the question. I've got to immediately try to make contact with her. And I said, well, please just do what you can. I want to try to be there when she arrives. And so I hang up the phone, quickly get dressed, run down the end of the driveway, out to the street. It just happened that Mr. McCall, our next door neighbor, was leaving his driveway at just that moment, flagged him over. He gave me a ride all the way down the hospital. And I got there before my mom did. As soon as I walk in the hospital and identify myself at the front desk there at the emergency room, I was given a brown bag. And in this brown bag were my brother's clothes but they were covered with blood. They're all bloodstained and they're shredded. They had actually been cut off of his body so they could get him off. And, uh, and as I look at this bag and these clothes, I said, look, um, do me a favor, get rid of this bag. I don't want my mom to see this. She's just gonna freak out. And, and, and so just, my brother's not gonna ever wear this stuff again, obviously. So, so just please just get the bag out of here. And within a few minutes, my mom comes through the revolving doors of the emergency room. As soon as we walk in, um, they usher me and my mom into this little ante room off of the emergency room. It's all white, like eerie white, white flowers, white furniture, white walls. And, and having seen this bag of, of, of bloody clothes, I'm starting to get a bad feeling that they don't bring people into this room to give them good news. And an orderly sits down and says, the doctor will be with you for just a few minutes, give you some information about your son, Mrs. Robbins. And she begins to fill out something. And I'm starting to get mad because I've seen this bag. My mom hasn't, but I've seen the bag. And, and I know that my mom's freaking out and they bring us into, this, into the death room. And so, and so I'm, I'm kind of getting irritated with the guy. I said, look, I want to know what's going on. You're, you know, you're giving us the runaround. What's going on? My brother, is he, is he okay? And this orderly... I'm sure because of hospital policy, I can't give you that information. You'll have to wait for the doctor. And, and so as quickly as he can, he dismisses himself. Well, I leave the room because now I'm really mad. I'm like 17 years old. My mom's in here crying. I'm kind of ticked off. And I go to this order. I said, look, buddy, my mom's in there crying. You take us into that room. And, and I've seen all these bloody clothes. I want to know, is my brother dead? Is my brother alive? And this guy says, I can't give you that information. It's hospital policy. But I can tell you this, there's no way your brother lived through that accident. 
His head was swollen, huge. He, he, he was actually hit by a woman in a car. He was turning left on his motorcycle. And a woman comes straight through the intersection, never saw him, and just broadsided him, knocked him like 20 feet. And this young guy, who's just trying to do his job, says there's no way he could have left through that. I'm not a doctor, but there's no way he could have lived through it. And I don't know if you've ever been given information like that, but your first response is denial. Your first response is to look for a rational reason to hope, to disbelieve. And so I said, that's impossible. He's my older brother. I said, there's no way. He can't, I mean, I, there's no way. He could. And I remembered, in fact, only a couple of weeks earlier, he'd bought this brand new helmet. He was so proud of a cool paint job. Awesome. And I remember him assuring my mom, don't worry, mom, this thing is going to protect me. Everything's great. He was so cocky. He had, and I said, there's no way he could have had, had his, he had this amazing helmet. And the guy cut me right off. I said, oh, oh, we know he had the helmet because the police found it strapped to the back of his motorcycle. Men and women, there's an important lesson in this passage of scripture. And it's the same lesson that hit me square between the eyes that summer morning. And it's this. The best armor in the world doesn't do any good if we don't put it on. Paul says, finally, take up the full armor of God. This is ours in Christ. Now, this turns out to be a good news and a bad news story. The good news is that the orderly was not a doctor, and my brother did live. And he's still alive. And he's mostly normal. He, he, he's still alive today. He said, well, what, 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 what possibly could be the bad news? The bad news is that some of us in this room are going to underestimate the wiles of the enemy. We're going to think, oh, yeah, you're right. That's kind of fantasy stuff. That's kind of hokum poke. That's not going to impact me. And we are not going to take possession of the victory that's ours in Christ. We're not going to put on this armor. And we're destined for defeat. My prayer today is that you would look at your life, I would look at my life and say, Lord, we know we have needs. This is a war of the worlds. But thank you that you have won it. You have won it on my behalf. Help me to take up the full armor that is mine in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you again for each of these people who are here today. I pray that you would help us to leave now recognizing that uh, although this room, this place seems peaceful, that we are at once, every moment of our lives, on a battleground and on holy ground. We are in a fight, a war of the worlds. We're walking with you, and that place where we walk is holy. But help us, Lord, not to take too lightly or not seriously this cosmic struggle. Help us instead to take up the full armor of God that is ours in Christ. We pray this now in Jesus' name.